a prayer as we open God's word. Lord God, this moment of preaching, it requires great gravity and great warmth. Gravity from the serious nature of the subject matter and warmth from the beloved nature of the saints assembled here. Oh God, unite this gravity and warmth in the unction that only comes from the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen. A testimony of apostasy or the power of a deconversion story. We're all very familiar with a testimony or the power of a conversion story. We usually include a testimony in our special services like at Easter, at Christmas. A lot of times when Wayne has the preaching, he, he loves to include a testimony as a part of his Bible teaching. A testimony is one of the most one of the most human and seemingly successful ways to reach lost people because somebody who's just a person like everybody else stands forward and says, this is what was happening in my life and this is how my life changed. It's a testimony. It's very compelling to hear the testimony of someone whose life was changed by the power of the gospel. This very troubling new thing is happening. Just a couple of weeks ago, I read this article, I think it was on Gospel Coalition, titled The Power of Deconversion Stories. A deconversion story is designed like a testimony, but not designed to reach uh, non-Christians. The deconversion story is designed to reach Christians. And the purpose of the testimony of deconversion is to convince Christians that they're outdated, naive beliefs are meant to be let go of. They no longer require your assent. In this kind of power of deconversion, this sort of testimony of apostasy, a, um, someone who used to be a Christian, a former professing Christian, shares his or her testimony of deconversion. The modern examples in this article I read were Bart Ehrman, Rob Bell, Peter Enns, Jen Hatmaker, among others. Each one of these had an alpha moment. They were professing uh, Bible-believing Christians. And then in their alpha moment, the Bible began to jar with their intellectual integrity or their cultural proclivities or their personal sensitivities or whatever it was. And they decided that their old beliefs about Jesus and the Bible had to be let go of. They had to go through a process of deconversion. This passage in Hebrews 10 takes deconversion as seriously as it can be taken. A very sober passage, beginning in verse 26 of Hebrews 10. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Anytime we read the Bible, we've got to go from them and back then to all of us and here and now. The story with them back then, the original audience of Hebrews 10, is a little bit like us, but a little bit different than us. The issue there was this, this church was almost 100% Hebrews or Jewish persons who were gathered into the church. And Hebrews 10 was written because some of these 
Jewish people who had come into church and claimed to come to Christ, they were about to let go of their Christian confession and be deconverted or reconverted back to Judaism minus Jesus Christ. The reason why was because it was becoming very costly to be a Christian and they could find some social acceptability and some get along and go along in the world if they just held on to the Jewish thing but they let go of Christ. Our situation or even the situation of those who were profiled in this article of deconversion is not exactly the same. There are some differences but it's not exactly different either. There are a whole lot of similarities because it's always the case that when it becomes more costly and less popular to follow Christ, many are tempted to fall away. Whether it's the lure of sin because you want to do a certain thing or live a certain way and Christ calls you away from it or whether it's just that kind of worldly pressure to be like everybody else and believe what's easy and popular to believe. So I want to look together at this text. It's a very sober text, but it's a very hopeful text as well. Just to make a simple observation, let's look together at the pronouns in the text because they lead us into uh, whether this text is entirely sort of negative and scary or whether there's a positive sort of let's all get together and make it through this. You know, the pronouns is the difference between the preacher pointing a finger and using the second person, you, or the third person, those weird bad people out there, or a shared first person pronoun like we or us. The text begins, I mean, we didn't read it, but in verse 22, 23, and 24, three times we have repeated, let us. So it's this mutual invitation, this collaboration to come together, let us do this. And then when the serious warning begins in verse 26, do you see the pronoun? In verse 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. It's not one guy up here wailing on all of you saying, if you do this. And it's not one guy even joined with some of you wailing on that third person world out there if they do this. He uses we in verse 26. And he comes back to the word we in verse 30, for we know him who said this. Then he switches to this um, anyone or such a one in verses 28 and 29. Anyone who does this or if such a one tramples underfoot, the son of God, he says in verse 29. But then we didn't read it, but if you go all the way to the last verse in the chapter, verse 39, he comes back to we. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere. I really like this because it's, you, you should like this too if you are a leader or a teacher or a mom or a dad or a grandparent or just a friend who tries to influence other friends. I love this because it's a, it's a clinic in how to do it the right way. This is so instructive for us. It's astonishing to me and it shouldn't be and it's heartbreaking to me and it should be heartbreaking how often, even in the church, when we correct or rebuke each other, it's too cold, too harsh, and there's no kind of let's work on this together about it. How often has someone just been shattered because a a mentor or a teacher just said to them, you're terrible at this, you'll never be able to do this, what's your problem? How much better to have a pastor or a dad or a friend who says, who says to you honestly, um, I'm concerned about you. This is something in your life that's bad and that really needs to be dealt with. But I'm talking to you about it right now because we can fix it and I want to help you. And though this threat, this bad thing in your life threatens you, this weakness in your life threatens you, it doesn't have to overwhelm you. And I'm here to make sure that it doesn't because I want to help you grow out of it. That's what he's doing here. 
That's why he comes back to the positive. He doesn't end on this note of dire warning. He doesn't end on a note of, common, uh, of uh, condemnation, but he comes back and says, we can make it through this together. I love that. So just having made those observations about how he does this, let's just make two very serious points out of this text. The first point is the serious nature of chosen sin. This is in verse 26 where he says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I want to talk to you about that word, if we go on sinning deliberately. And that word is lifted actually from the book of Numbers chapter 15. And so I'd ask you to go back there. Even if you don't know the Old Testament very well, it goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So it should be the fourth book in your Old Testament. And the, the word actually in the Greek in Hebrews 10 for sinning deliberately is a translation of this important Hebrew word from Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. Numbers 15 talks about unintentional sin and intentional sin. Sinning in ignorance without intention and sinning with a high hand and full knowledge deliberately. So if you're in Numbers 15, pick it up in uh, verse 27. It says in verse 27, if one person sins unintentionally, not deliberately, if one person sins unintentionally, he shall offer a female goat a year old for his sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who makes a mistake when he sins unintentionally to make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is a native among the people of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourns among you. But, verse 30, the contrast, but the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. That last phrase that such a person will be cut off and his iniquity be, will be on him is parallel to the phrase in Hebrews 10 where it said there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. His sin is not atoned for. He's stuck with the consequences of his sin. But the phrase that's translated in Hebrews 10, sinning deliberately, is this phrase, sins with a high hand, there in Numbers chapter 15 and verse 30. The person who does anything with a high hand. And when you heard that, when I first read that, I pictured someone shaking their fist at God. I'm going to do this. I don't care what you say. It's not, the picture's not of shaking your fist at the heavens. This is a, a specific Hebrew phrase about oath taking. It's, uh, it expresses solemn intent as if when this sin is committed, I'm doing this, I'm saying in my right mind, knowing my identity, I raise my hand and I say, I know who I am and God, I know who you are and I know what you have said about what I ought to be doing, but I am gonna do what I wanna do because I'm me. It's a scary thing. How it works in Hebrews 10 is it's saying these uh, professing believers who have not just visited the church once or twice, but they have come all the way into the church so they know who God is and what the gospel is and they know what God says. I, I now know what God says about me and about sin. And even knowing all of that, I'm gonna decide high-handedly and hard-heartedly to reject Jesus and go my own way. It's like, I mean, right now, in this moment, where after the last worship song, they put 1 John up there, they talked about walking in the light. It's like, if we're ever supposed to be in the light, it's here, in this moment, while the word is open and I'm preaching to you, 
while you're surrounded by people, hopefully, you're not surrounded by hypocrites who you hate. You're surrounded by people who are supposed to be examples to you of walking in the light so that you know somebody nearby that you're like, yeah, I know that they used to commit this sin and they don't anymore. They showed me how to repent. They showed me how to change. And here in the light, while we're surrounded by others who are showing us living examples of what it means, it is possible that even here in this moment, you know what God says about the sin that you plan to commit this week and you are willing to do it anyway. It's horrific to have a hardened heart and a high raised hand. Now Hebrews 10, in addition to saying the one who sins deliberately, it makes it a present progressive because in verse 26 it says, if we go on sinning, it doesn't just say if we sin one time past punctiliar aorist, it says if we go on sinning. So this warning in Hebrews 10 is not about a Christian child who makes a mistake, who stumbles into sin. It's not even about a Christian child who stumbles into the same sin 20 times. It's talking about someone who stops listening to God and walks deliberately into sin with no intention of ever confessing or repenting. It's deliberate and it's ongoing. This text in Hebrews 10 is an impressive warning about an intensive case of someone who knows what God has said, knows the remedy for sin, and says, I reject Jesus because I want my sin. It's not talking about someone who just sins because we all sin. You went back to Numbers, go uh, ahead to 1 John. 1 John is actually one of the only books that's to the right of Hebrews. And 1 John is so helpful here. Go to 1 John 1 and 1 John 3 and I'll try to show you what this means. Because I want the warning from Hebrews 10, I, I want it to startle you, but I don't want it to mislead you into thinking that you're not saved if you really are. And 1 John is very helpful here because 1 John says, we all stumble into sin. It even says we all sin. But Christians don't go on in sin without confessing and repenting. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. 1 John 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I love that the beginning and the end of this little pericope here, he says, Everyone sins. If you say you don't sin, you're lying. And then after that, he comes back in the end and he says, if we say we have no sin, we're lying. This is great news because it means to, uh, to get on God's good side or to just make it uh, much less important and much more human, uh, to get on the pastor's good side, you don't have to be a church member who walks in and says, hey, I never sinned this week. Don't you love me now? That ain't the way it works. If you come in and say, I never sinned, then I will say, you are a liar. Find another church. <laughs> he says that twice. You can't say that you never sin. We all sin. But what it says right there so beautifully in verse 9 is when we sin, if we are in Christ, we confess our sin and he cleanses us. It is the unbeliever who has no Christ in her life, no Christ in his life, that walks in sin and never confesses, never repents, never wants to make it right. This is what's talked about in 1 John 3. Turn ahead to 1 John 3, verses 4 through 10. 1 John 3, verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning, 
also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. That's in Jesus. There's no sin in Jesus. Verse six, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. The issue here is continuation with no confession. The issue here is continuation without remorse and without repentance. That's the issue. You can't read 1 John 3 and say anyone who commits a sin can't possibly be a Christian because 1 John 1 already told you every Christian sins. The issue here is continuation without confession. The truly saved, when they wander into the darkness, they don't want to stay in the darkness. Why not? Because they love the light. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's, they, they love Jesus and they hate the fact that they've distanced themselves from Jesus. The only, the only way I can talk about this personally is to talk about my own life. And I don't, I don't know how to say it except just to say it. I, I have not conquered all the sin in my life. I sin. But I can tell you as honestly as I'm able humanly, I don't, I don't maintain a hard, closed heart toward Jesus. When I sin, it drives me crazy because I love Jesus and I don't want to be me without Jesus. I want him. And so when I sin, it never takes forever for me to come back to Jesus and say, I failed. I'm sorry. I love you. True believers confess their sin. It is those who sin and never confess who evidence the fact that they neither believe in nor love Jesus, the Savior of sinners. Where does this leave the uh, security of salvation? It was date night this week on, on uh, Thursday we actually picked up our son and Amy and I took him out to dinner and a show in Milwaukee. And we were driving up to Milwaukee and even though it was date night, I was talking to Amy about this sermon. Like I never, I never escape it. That probably makes me a bad husband or a good spiritual leader, depending how you look at it. So I'm talking to her about this, you know, and um, I said something about what I was going to say about Hebrews 10. And she says, that sounds like you just said you can lose your salvation. We don't believe that, do we? I was like, um, no, we don't. <laughs> so in reverential respect toward Amy and her care for my clarity, to clarify this point, the, uh, the Bible says, or the, the doctrine we call it is the, the perseverance of the saints, the security of eternal salvation. The believer no matter how much they struggle and stumble, they continue to believe that Jesus is the savior of sinners. So 1 John 1, 9, when they sin, they confess and they trust Jesus. This is, the, the, I mean, you see it in Peter. What worse sin is there than denying Christ? And yet Peter, after he denied Christ, he was like, I, I don't want to be a man who denies Christ. I love Christ and Christ welcomes him back. He didn't lose his salvation and then regain it. He never lost it. He stumbled in sin, but as a true believer, he confessed that sin. The believer, no matter how much they struggle and stumble, they never get to the point where they no longer believe that Jesus is their savior and the savior of sinners. So they come back to him. True faith perseveres and continues to trust Christ. Christ. 
So that's a, a little bit of teaching, both from Hebrews and from uh, Numbers and 1 John on the seriousness of sin. Let me make this very personal. How can you, how can you be sure that this doesn't happen to you? How can you be sure that when you wander into sin, you stay sensitive to Christ and you come back, but so that you don't become someone who wanders into sin and then be, really becomes the evidence of an unbeliever who never comes back to Christ? Well, the answer and how you be certain that this doesn't happen to you is right there in Hebrews 10. It says in verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, verse 22, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is how you make certain that you don't become an apostate. You draw near to Christ. You cling to the confession of gospel faith. What this means is you tell yourself the truth about sin and about Jesus. What this means is when you feel like wandering away from church, is the exact time when you feel like wandering away from church is the exact time when you make sure you are in church. Some of you have the terrible habit. It is a soul endangering habit of following yourself. You must cultivate by the spirit of God, the gospel born habit of leading yourself. Some of you have the soul endangering habit of listening to yourself. And you need by God's strength to cultivate the gospel saturated habit of speaking to yourself. When yourself begins to wander, you need to tell yourself the truth about sin, about Jesus, about the consequences of sin, about the reality of Calvary and all of it. You need to preach the gospel to yourself, especially in the times when yourself says, shut up, I just want to live in sin for a little while longer in peace. Those are the exact times when yourself has to tell yourself to shut up and speak the truth about sin and Jesus to yourself. And not only yourself, but verses 24 and 25, you need the church speaking that truth into your life because we can all deceive ourselves if we're left to ourselves. So the church is this bundle of relationships. So we help each other endure till the end because the community of faith shines the light onto the darkness of unbelief. The community of faith brings the heat to the coldness of unbelief. The community of faith brings the fellowship of spirit-filled people to the isolation of unbelief. The way to be sure you don't become apostate is neither complex nor confusing. In other words, if you don't put this to practice, it is not because you don't understand it. It is because you don't like it. You don't want to do it. The application is confess your sin, repent, speak the truth of God to yourself, move into relationships that will help you spiritually. None of those things are complicated. All of those things are something that a, that a, that a healthy eight-year-old can begin to do. Well, that's the first, the serious nature of sin. And second, even more seriously, is the serious nature of God's judgment. Here we find the author saying when this happens, there's a fearful, verse 27, expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? 
to support the statement that he's making, and this should not surprise us, to support the statement that he's making, he reaches back to the Old Testament law. This should not surprise us because for 10 chapters now, we've been contrasting the Old Testament with how much Christ is better, the Old Testament with how much Christ is better. And here, he's talking about judgment for sin and the, 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 the expectation of the wrath of God against an apostate, against, a, against an unbelieving sinner. And he reaches back and compares it to this incident from the law of Moses. If I'm, if I'm getting his reference right, he's actually talking about when the Old Testament says somebody uh, broke the Sabbath commandment by gathering wood on the Sabbath. If a, if a Hebrew Israelite gathered wood on the Sabbath, this Old Testament text said that such a one should be put to death. And he's making a comparison. And he's saying, if that was the case in the Old Testament, what do you think it is now? In other words, this sort of, this sort of messes you up if you're someone who has said, oh, God is very wrathful in the Old Testament, but now that Jesus has come, everything's peachy. Because what he's saying is, if this was the standard of God's divine wrath when all God had revealed was the Ten Commandments, how much worse now that God has revealed not only the Ten Commandments, but God has revealed the blood of His one and only Son. The measure of the privilege of the New Covenant necessarily defines the measure of peril to those who reject Christ. And it just kills me how he says in verse 29, how much worse punishment do you think? This is where I get off the hook. I'm, I don't have to explain all this to you. All I have to do is say, the Spirit of God right now in the Word of God said, hey, I want you to go home and think about this. Don't distract yourself away from it. You think about it. This is, this is again a place where we're upside down because every single one of us is like, I don't want to think about hell. I don't want to think about the wrath of God. Jesus healing a widow all day long. Let's go, Jesus. But I, this, oh, the judgment and wrath and hell. Let's just, if we have to get that, okay, we sign it on the church doctrinal statement, but we don't want to think about it. And this is exactly what the Spirit of God says. You ought to think about that. If this was the Old Testament penalty for breaking the Sabbath, what will be the penalty for those who trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God? That Greek word for trample is from Luke 8, where the seed was on the path and everybody who walked, it's not even like they cared about the seed and they were like, I hate that seed, I'm going to trample on it. They just walked over it. They're just treating it as common, as dirt. If you have come into the church and you've heard the gospel, You've heard it enough to understand it and still you reject it. How dare you treat the blood of the Son of God as if it were dirt? And we have this almost, almost unbelievable phrase where the Spirit of God, this is I think the only time in the New Testament where the Spirit of God is called the Spirit of Grace. And it's mind-blowing because in this text where the Spirit of God is called the Spirit of Grace, look what it says. This is like a, this, this is mind-blowing on the all-encompassing reality of the character of God because it says the one who has trampled underfoot the, the, the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant has outraged the Spirit of Grace. If he is the Spirit of Grace, how can he be outraged? I do not know, but I know that he can. And I know this is what does it. And then in verse 31, it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is called the living God here and also in Hebrews 12, 22, also in Hebrews 3, 12, also in Hebrews 9, 14, he's called the living God. And notice it says, fall into the hands. Notice, notice. It's an anthropomorphism. It's a human 
metaphor. The author is at pains to not have you think, oh, here's some sort of bookish category of judgment that might happen to someone. He says, these are the hands of God and they are reaching for you in wrath. And he calls him the living God. How alive do you want God to be? If I'm in a jam, like the first prayer in the book of Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2 aren't prayer. First prayer is in Psalm 3. And the first prayer in the Psalms is, Oh Lord, my enemies have, have arisen against me. Oh living God, save me. If my enemies are against me and I'm in a jam, I want God to be very alive. But how alive do you want God to be if you are his enemy? If I know I have profaned God and spit in his face, I would much prefer God to be sleepy and otherwise engaged. But he's the living God. I don't claim to understand nearly everything there is to understand about the judgment of God, but I must clearly proclaim to you that I will not dodge any of it and what the word of God says about it, I will believe I won't even believe it apologetically. I will believe it because God has revealed it. And when we think about hell, you know, put it this way, we're not, you're not supposed to fear hell. There's only one, there's only one whom you are ever supposed to fear. Only one, right? When Jesus talked about hell in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, he said, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We just get a little mixed up about the judgment of God in hell. I, I could go highbrow or I could go lowbrow. Let's go lowbrow first. Uh, comic books and a and, uh, red devil with a pitchfork or whatever. Or we could go high brow and say uh, Dante. I don't know if you ever read Dante on hell. Like the, the, th when he gets to the bottom of it, it's not hot, it's cold. And Satan keeps himself frozen by the beating of his wings in resistance that he can't pull up. It's like all of this imagery about hell. But... Jesus says in Matthew 10, when he talks about hell, he, he, he literally says, I'm not talking to you about being afraid because I make the flames this realistic or the sharp point of the torture device this realistic. He says, fear the one, the one who sends both body and soul to that place. In the Bible church, we often talk about in the Bible church, where I'm happy to hang my hat, we often use phrases that we think are in the Bible but aren't. And we talk about doctrine in ways that our cliches sort of lead us, and then we end up believing the cliche. But if we like look more carefully at Scripture, it's probably, it, you know, it's like, let, let's be a little more biblical. I'm all, all for that. Even in the Bible church, we use these phrases, and maybe we should just get rid of them. We say that hell is separation from God, and we say that heaven is for those who have a personal relationship with God. Actually, this says, and Matthew 10 says, and Hebrews 10 says, that everyone has a personal relationship with God. He is Savior, Father, gracious forgiver, or he is righteous, wrathful judge. But no one escapes him. Just like Hebrews 10 does not end with warning, but it ends in verse 39 by saying, we're going to make it if we cling to Christ and we cling to each other. I would never end this morning without coming back to the gospel. Because, well, look at it this way. It says in verse 26, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. You know, there's an upside to that. If it says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins for a certain person, what does it mean? It's saying the good news of the gospel, which is there 
is a sacrifice for sins. There is. And there's only one case in which you could possibly become someone for whom there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But for everyone else, there is a sacrifice for sins. What is the sacrifice for sins? It is Jesus. If the fear is to fall into the hands of the living God, the gospel is that the Son of God in our place fell into the hands of the living God and endured the wrath of God. The love of God provides a way to escape from the wrath of God. This is the sacrifice of the Son of God. And when the Son of God fell into the hands of the living God, and it was as if God the Father said at Golgotha, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And all the sins of all those for whom Christ died were paid in full. There remains a sacrifice for sin for those who will believe, those who will receive Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. So all I'm saying with all that I am is believe in Jesus, the only Savior. If you have never believed in Jesus, if your sins are still upon you and you've never had a Savior, today is the day of your salvation. Would you believe that Jesus is the Savior. Make him yours. Believe. And if you are here and you are already my brother, my sister, you have believed in Jesus. You know what I have to say to you? You know what I have to say to you? Today is the day to believe in Jesus. If if you leave here and you wander from Jesus, you don't know how Monday and Tuesday will turn into Thursday and Friday 28 years from now and there may be no faith in your heart. Believe in Jesus today, today. For he is the Savior who took the wrath, who took the vengeance, who fell into the hands of living God for us. Flee to Christ. Let's pray. living, present Spirit of God, gracious Heavenly Father, Savior Jesus Christ, hear your children as we pray. And Lord, we pray for Spirit of God, we pray for those here who have never trusted Jesus Christ. All bring them to Christ even now. And Spirit of God, we pray for those here who have trusted Christ but who need to have their faith renewed and strengthened. Oh, bring them to repentance and confession and strengthen their living faith in Jesus Christ, the only Savior. Do this and be glorified in your church now and forever. Jesus, we pray. Amen. To stand as we sing and respond together.
church go with this word of benediction. May, may the name of God be glorified in you as you go with the faith and with the hope and with the love that is only ours because we are in Christ Jesus. Amen.